Hi, this is Eric Prostowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. With me today is uh, Dr. Nazem Akum, who is Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Washington, and he's also the director of their AFib program. Welcome, Nazem. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Dr. Prostowski, and with the entire HRS audience. So, we're going to discuss, I think, a very exciting area, and you've been one of the uh, leaders in this area. Uh, for many years, I've been very disappointed with the Chaz Vask scoring system for stroke risk. I think you and I have both seen patients who had a, a score of zero yet come in with a stroke, and there are others who have a very high score who never get a stroke. And I've always felt there's, there's got to be ways to make it better, but your work on fibrosis, I think, is really, really interesting. So uh, what I'd like you to do is explain to us some of your recent research in the use of uh, atrial fibrosis to help predict stroke? Thank you so much for the opportunity to share our research with you. I uh, completely agree with you. The CHADS-2 VAS score and before it, the CHADS-2 score um, were very good clinical tools. They're easy to use. However, everybody who uses them understands that they are very poor in predicting um, strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. And the main reason for that is because currently we still lack an understanding of the mechanism by which any of these clinical risk factors that are accounted for in these scores actually mechanistically lead to a stroke. Um, the uh, other limitations uh, for these scores is that they also don't capture the entire uh, risk profile and there are some risk factors that have uh, been also associated with uh, stroke and atrial fibrillation that are not included um, in these scores. So the, the other piece of background information that's also super important to, to talk about is uh, number one, the observation that there is a temporal dissociation between um, episodes of atrial tachyarrhythmias detected through implantable cardiac rhythm devices and actual thromboembolic events. So the classic paradigm where uh, patients go into AFib, form a clot, and embolize that clot to have a stroke is put into question with these temporal dissociation type studies and makes us wonder, well, since these patients with pacemakers for the most part actually don't show us AFib prior to their stroke, is AFib really a necessary component to that? Or is there something um, that is common to both AFib and stroke that's going on in these patients' atria? Um, added to that, a special group of patients with uh, stroke that is uh, often blamed on occult AFib, and these are the cryptogenic stroke patients, um, where AFib is suspected, but uh, not found as commonly as we, as we would expect. For, for example, in the crystal AF study where patients with cryptogenic stroke were offered uh, implantable loop monitors, the rate of detection of atrial fibrillation of 30 seconds duration or longer was only 30% at three years, which means that about 70% of those patients with cryptogenic stroke actually don't show AFib and we don't have an explanation for their stroke. So um, it led us down the path of this alternate pathway where um, maybe AFib, our hypothesis is that AFib may not be a uh, essential component in the pathophysiology of stroke um, and the alternate hypothesis that um, we're gathering evidence uh, in support of is that atrial disease, underlying atrial disease, fibrosis being the hallmark of that, um, is the underlying mechanism for the predisposition to thrombus formation in atria independent of atrial fibrillation as a clinical uh, arrhythmia. So to further support this um, hypothesis, um, we looked at fibrosis in uh, different populations of patients. First, uh, patients with AFib, and uh, we know that fibrosis plays an integral part in creating a substrate for AFib in patients who have the arrhythmia. And we looked in that group of patients uh, who have had a history of stroke, whether their atria are more diseased, meaning having more fibrosis, and sure enough, patients with atrial fibrillation and a history of stroke were shown to have 
a higher fibrosis burden compared to atrial fibrillation patients without stroke. And then we said, okay, that is consistent with, with our new hypothesis. Let's go and look at the source. So let's go with the, and look at that atrial appendage where most of the thrombi and atrial fibrillation are found. And we wanted to see if there was an association between appendage abnormalities, whether it's thrombus or spontaneous contrast, which is a prelude to thrombus in most echocardiography studies. And uh, we also found that patients with atrial fibrillation who are undergoing transesophageal echoes, who are found to have thrombi, also on average have a significantly higher fibrosis burden compared to AFib patients, but without um, a history of, um, of thrombus. Um, the next population that we studied was those uh, cryptogenic stroke patients. So we did a case control study where uh, we enrolled patients with newly diagnosed cryptogenic stroke. And we wanted to see what is the burden of atrial fibrosis in those patients who by definition do not have atrial fibrillation in comparison to age and sex matched control groups. And we recruited control groups from uh, a healthy population without AFib and without stroke. And we also enrolled patients with AFib who are also age and sex matched. And what we showed in our paper uh, was that compared to the healthy controls, patients with embolic stroke of undetermined source or cryptogenic stroke had a significantly higher atrial fibrosis burden compared to those healthy controls. However, in comparison to their AFib age and sex matched uh, counterparts, the degree of fibrosis involvement was exactly the same. Have the exact same substrate in terms of fibrosis as that seen in atrial fibrillation. However, they don't have the clinical arrhythmia. So this is another piece of evidence in support of this direct link between atrial disease and fibrosis and atrial dysfunction, thrombus formation, and stroke independent of the actual arrhythmia of atrial fibrillation. So let me, most... let me, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Let me jump in though, because I think this is a very exciting area of, of investigation. And again, you're to be congratulated uh, leading the charge. Um, I've been a big fan of the concept that substrate is part of the issue. As you, you probably know, I've Absolutely. talked about that. We learned that from you a long time ago. <laughs> well, I, I learned it from others, so I, I can't take uh, I can't take the uh, all the credit by any means. But um, I think there's two things I want you to address sort of quickly. Um, one is that while I, I you'd like to make a link, there there was a study published recently where they looked at all the cryptogenic stroke patients and they anticoagulated whether they had AFib or not, and it didn't work out. Yet we do know if you have documented AFib. Uh, you can clearly reduce the stroke burden. So um, there's probably, it doesn't negate what you're saying, but it, the story is probably more complicated, don't you think? I completely agree. The story is definitely um, very complicated and we're beginning to understand it. This is why this is a very exciting field of study. So the studies that you were referring to in the embolic stroke of undetermined source uh, population tested anticoagulating patients with uh, this diagnosis sort of in an unselected fashion. Everybody right, right. Who, who has uh, embolic stroke of undetermined source was uh, randomized to either receive a uh, DOAC or uh, to be on aspirin, which is the standard of care currently. And uh, the unselected approach showed that there was no advantage of anticoagulating everybody uh, with ESIS. However, um, Patients within that study specifically navigate ESIS, where uh, an assessment of the atrial substrate um, measured by atrial size actually did show that those patients with uh, enlarged atria did benefit from um, anticoagulation. So it also speaks to uh, the fact that ESIS is not a, is not a homogeneous population. There are patients that um, are truly cardioembolic and um, the clot comes from the atria, but there are probably other patients with ESIS that are not along the same pathophysiological mechanism. Now, 
I will also tell you about a follow-up study that we did on our uh, ESIS cohort, and this was a multi-center cohort uh, from the US and Europe, where we followed patients with ESIS where we had quantified their atrial fibrosis. And we followed them for two clinically important endpoints. One was recurrent stroke, and the other was newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. And within that ESIS cohort, those uh, were those with advanced atrial fibrosis, so higher than the median for that group, actually had a um, higher incidence of recurrent stroke, which is an important uh, clinical endpoint for secondary prevention, and independently, um, a higher incidence of newly diagnosed AFib. Um, so those patients with ESIS and advanced atrial disease measured by fibrosis in our case, but also measured by enlarged atria and navigate ESIS, seem to be a subgroup of that population that will probably benefit from oral anticoagulation. And this is our next step. This is the study that we're trying to launch uh, based on our findings. So Nazem, thank you so much. And I'm sure our listeners are gonna be very grateful for the information you've imparted. Uh, we look forward to part two and you uh, have, uh, broken the code as it were. So thanks for joining us and you have a great day. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much.